Let me now turn it over to Barry and Miko. We're going to do a little uh, more party routine today, I think. Um, but um, I do want to begin by uh, acknowledging, of course, the hard work of our collaborators, Stephen and Caitlin and Ben. So Ben is here too. Um, this is a, a talk in part about um, making a course go uh, and making a course go in a very different way. And it's also about building systems that uh, inform how those courses operate. Uh, and we'll say more about both those things uh, in the course of the presentation. We, I think, invite your questions. Will we wait till the end or do throughout? We didn't discuss this part. Either way. So either way is fine. Uh, we will repeat your question back for the recording. So don't worry about, uh, about having a microphone today. Um, we, um, we also, we're showing a tool today called Gradecraft, and we'll get more into that uh, in a moment. And it's a tool that we're hoping to open up for more and more people to use. Um, but uh, it's not quite a, an off already sort of like the plug into your C tools um, course yet. Um, but we can definitely, if you see something in here and you say this would apply so perfectly to what I want to do, then we do want to talk to you about that and think about uh, what the potential is for including you in the growing circle of instructors that are trying to do this work. So I um, want to begin by thinking a little bit about play. So. Um, <coughs> Why is play important? Well, it's important for what a colleague of mine at MIT, Scott Osterweil, talks about as being the four freedoms. And um, the four freedoms, as Scott frames them, are the freedom to experiment, to try new things out, to take a, take a risk, which is important because you have the freedom to fail. So that means that in a gameful space, you're not so worried about uh, trying something that may seem risky in the real world. Um, because you know that in the game space, if your character dies, um, you get another chance, and the cost of that second chance are pretty low. So it's okay, you want to take a risk. In fact, there's a game that I like a lot um, on the iPhone called One Life. I don't know if you've seen this, but the idea of One Life sort of toys with that idea. You um, leap from building to building, and you get to practice your jump as many times as you want. But if you miss the jump, then your character falls, uh, and the game locks up, and the only way to keep playing is to delete it off your phone or re-download it from the App Store. So it's sort of playing with the idea of what makes games, what gives you the freedom to fail in games. Um, freedom of perspective is important. So you can choose to look at the world in different ways in a game. You can be the good guy, you can be the bad guy. Maybe when you, many people who play games will play them through more than once to try different things out that you didn't try the previous time. Um, and you have freedom of effort. You can try as hard as you want, or, um, or sort of be as laid back as you want in the game space. You can engage as you wish, and that's also very important as far as uh, regulating um, how hard you're working at various moments. And a well-designed game will find ways to get you to work very hard when the game wants you to work hard, to really be deeply engaged and um, to, uh, to go all out. And th these are, that won't be surprising, you can hear what I'm saying and probably think um, about the ways that those ideas map onto the way we think about instruction, what we're trying to accomplish in classrooms. We are, as an experiment for me today, using Google's presentation tools to actually present and not going forward, Mika. Absolutely. It is a vital distinction, actually, and uh, sometimes we choose the course. So the question is about the choice that's actually involved in playing games versus the choice that's actually involved in taking courses. Um, so sometimes you do have more freedom about the courses you choose to take than others also, which is another consideration. In fact, Mika's class, which we'll be talking about as a case study here, um, is a class that is a prerequisite if you want to be a political science major. So there's not a lot of choice there. Um, I use these ideas in my class, which is a completely optional class. It's, it's part of no major. Um, and, and so we get somewhat different responses from students in those situations. So we'll come back to that. My contention is that you can take some of the ideas from the playful game space and apply them to good effect in the formal education space. 
Um, in fact, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. This will be sort of a recurring theme. So the magic circle. One of the reasons why games work so well is they create this space that when you, um, when you enter the space, you're not shocked by things that happen like monsters appearing or suddenly you can fly, right? And classrooms also create a kind of magic circle um, where we accept certain things. Like we accept that before you can speak, you have to raise your hand, right? Or that, uh, that judgments of how good my thinking is are transactional and rooted in the number of questions I mark correctly on an exam. You know, this is sort of the rules of the game space. And one of, one of the claims that we make today is that school is also a game. It's just a terrible game, um, right? So we are, in part, trying to improve the game of school with this work. And uh, a big part of the challenge for us, and this actually comes right back to that great first question, is getting students out of the sort of the head space of school and getting them into a more playful space, which is tricky, especially I would claim at a place like Michigan, where we're basically dealing with students who are, have become, in many ways, champion players of the standard school game, right? There's nothing that a champion hates worse than when you change the rules. <laughs> All right, so we need this better game to play. Here's what we're trying to do. You know, I think the problem is I keep trying to see it here, and so I keep messing this up. It's awesome, by the way, for me to need technical support when I'm doing this kind of thing, so this is a nice change for me, too. So thank you, Mika. Um, did it go forward? Is that the next one? It did go forward, but I wonder if it's good. Oh, no, this is it. Okay, so what are the underpinnings? You know, I'm just going to look at the slides up here and see yeah, what I'm talking about and move this here. So um, the underpinnings of a better game for school, I think, are built uh, from two premises, right? First set of premises, motivation. Now we have motivation experts in the room. I'm not going to give a treatise on motivation here. I'm just going to sort of refer to some of the theories that we think are useful for us in this work. And um, we can talk more about them later and how they actually function. But uh, one is the idea of uh, goal theory. So in a nutshell, students have different kinds of orientations to learning. They might be mastery oriented where their goal is to learn as much as they can and be as competent as they can. They might be performance oriented, where their goal is to do as well as they can. And those two things are complementary, and they also are conflicting in various ways. And I would claim that our goal here is to get people to more toward mastery kinds of orientations. Uh, the second theory that we're uh, playing off of here is something called self-determination theory. But the three terms to remember in relation to self-determination theory are um, autonomy, belonging, and competence, or ABC. So uh, this is a theory that talks about intrinsic motivation uh, and enjoyment being enhanced when you feel like, you, like your choices are consequential, that's autonomy, that you, and you have some freedom to make choices, when you feel like you belong to something larger than yourself. So you're part of a team effort, um, you're part of a field, you're, you're learning to enter, you're a, a legitimate purple practitioner in a field, and competence. So when you feel like your competence is supported, you're not constantly feeling like an idiot, right? Again, you can see the relationship between these ideas and teaching, right? Um, from game design, uh, three very simple ideas. Good games usually have multiple routes to success. There's not just a single pathway to follow, but you could choose your own adventure, if you will. Um, they do support, as I mentioned before, productive failure and risk-taking. Um, and they have this idea embedded in them that you level up as you go. So you start, everybody starts from the same place at ground zero, and as you make progress through the game, you uh, gain points or whatever, levels, skills, competencies, to keep moving forward. So now let's map that onto assessment, assessment systems. So in a traditional assessment system, um, you begin... Um, you begin often with 100%, right? And I've had instructors say to me, and maybe you've had instructors say to you, everybody has an A plus today. You know, and what you do from here on out will determine whether you keep that A plus. So from the very beginning, the whole system is set up as sort of a subtractive enterprise. Um, and you're just fighting to keep your average at a certain level, and then you lose ground. Walking here today, crossing the bridge, I heard two, uh, two young women talking about, uh, I assume, a final exam coming up and saying, there's no way, I mean, there's no way I can keep a B in this class, so why bother, right? Uh, or something to that effect. Um, so uh, we're trying to create um, sort of a sense of control of self-determination where there's been a lack of control. 
we're trying to give students uh, the choice and the focus as opposed to instructors always choosing the focus. Um, this is about earning the grade, and grades in quotes there, because whether it's a grade or something else is, I think, up for grabs, as opposed to always feeling like they're receiving grades. We really want to encourage risk taking by lowering the cost of failure. And the bottom one is a big one for me. We're trying to incentivize progression instead of incentivizing avoidance of risk. So this is the difference. And later, Mika will talk about his particular course structure and how it maps onto this space. So um, I want to show you an example, because a lot of people may say, isn't this just this phrase that is in the ether these days called gamification? And um, it's not. And let me show you how it's not. <coughs> This is an example from a show that uh, many of you will be familiar with, Malcolm in the Middle. This is what gamification often looks like in a classroom space. Well, I have your test results. You all got A's. But since this is the gifted class, I also factored in cogency of argument, economy of language, and penmanship, which enabled me to do this. What is that? A ranking board. But I thought you said we all got A's. Oh, you did. But some of you got better A's than others. <laughs> but we all still have A's? Of course. So uh, what does being number one get you? Nothing. Just the knowledge that you are number one, or that you are not number one. Yes, number five. It's that monster. I know. What is it, number five? I forgot. All right, so don't do that, okay? <laughs> and we, in fact, don't use leaderboards. We have a different approach to that, which we'll show you later. Um, let me switch back around. of what you need. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to turn to a great philosopher, Ian Bogos, a colleague in game, uh, design and game theory from, um, from Georgia Tech. And um, I've also always wanted to use the word bullshit in a presentation, so thanks to Ian, I get to do that. But his take on gamification is that it's primarily a tool used by marketers and companies to impress, conceal, and coerce. And he's actually using the term here in a philosophical way, quoting Harry Frankfurt from Princeton, um, who talks about the value of bullshit in society is that it gives you tools for doing this. And we don't want to do this. We're not about coercion. Right? We're trying to set up a space where people sort of voluntarily want to work hard and, and come forward, as opposed to us tricking them into working hard or creating a negative motivation for them to work hard. So the way we do that is A, think about course design, and B, think about supportive technology um, and we're going to talk, of course, about how learning analytics plays into all of this, because what we're really trying to build here is, a, is an ecology of teaching and learning that is gameful and is playful um, and is game-inspired. So we're going to avoid the term from now on gamified, um, and I encourage you to also, as you talk about this with your colleagues. So Gradecraft, this is Gradecraft. Um, it's a learning management system or a learning management system add-on. One way I think about it is a replacement for the grade book. Um, and, the, and a replacement, and it's got some other features. It's sort of a grade book on steroids. Um, it integrates many different features and functions. For instance, it has a badging capability, and we'll talk more about badges in a little while. Um, its main functionality is that it shows you um, where you are in the class right now, what your current point total is. And in my classes, I happen to use points, and Mika's class, we're using points. It doesn't need to be points. It could be other things, too. It could be levels. Um, it could be grades. I mean, it could be any any sort of currency or any marker you care to put on it. Um, the system itself is very flexible. It doesn't actually presume a particular vocabulary if you're talking about your teaching. It lets you define that as the instructor. If, by the way, the system is so flexible that you could use this to teach your standard graded on a curve out of 100% uh, lecture course if you wanted to. I just wouldn't recommend it. Right? It doesn't actually add any value that way. It really adds value when you think about 
changing your orientation to teaching. Uh, so this is a, a, a login for a particular student, not a real student, um, who's able to see sort of what their assignments are, the different categories that they're working in, what, where they stand in each one. But what makes it interesting um, is its ability to show you where you stand. So remember I said no ranking boards? So instead of using a ranking or a leaderboard, in this case you see a box in whisker plot, right? Because in a class with 100 or more people, knowing that you're, you know, number 80 doesn't make you feel very motivated. But having some sense of where you sort of stand in relation to the range in the, in the middle 20, you know, the middle standard deviation or part, partial standard deviation is important. Um, and um, So um, one of the key functions here is this grade predictor functionality, where you can go and literally game the course, right? Because you have multiple pathways and you're trying to decide, do I want to do this kind of assignment or that kind of assignment? Um, you need to see what the you know what the costs and benefits are of each path. So we have built in grade prediction tools, and one of the things that that this provides a real opportunity for analytics for us, because the grade prediction tools are a thing that we can look at to see. How often you check, is that an indicator maybe of how engaged you are or of, uh, of what your current sort of feelings are with respect to your performance in the class? And we'll show you some data related to that in a few moments. Um, but in general, the idea here is to increase autonomy and support for competence. So the belonging part comes in other places. And we'll show you some data related to uh, the goal orientation um, with respect to how these tools get used in performance in the class as well. So this is this is um, the instructor view, and right now it's a little uh, it's it's a little poor in how it presents information. So it's an area we're putting a lot of energy into. Actually, we're also putting a lot of energy into the student interface too to make more of a dashboard approach, so you don't have to keep switching modes. But in this case, um, the the instructor. Uh, and this is also, by the way, not the current state. This is sort of the next, our next interface idea. But in general, the instructor has the ability to sort of scan and see student attendance um, and, and get different views on things with uh, sort of a traditional stoplight sort of indicator. Um, see what badges students have earned, what their current grade in the class is, and what their predicted grade is. So this would be their current standing. This would be the grade they said they want to end up in. So that sort of gives you some sense of what the students are hoping they'll be doing in the class and what they might actually do. So just a word uh, before I, I'm going to turn this over to Mika in a moment to tell you about his class in particular. But um, the research approach here is a combination of design-based research and something new in the landscape that uh, we're calling design-based implementation research. So for those not familiar with design-based research, it's essentially um, it's an engineering approach to, re to doing research in education or social science. It's an interventionist approach to doing research where you begin with um, a theory, and that's a, a small t theory, um, and by that I mean not constructivism or behaviorism, but a, a small t theory might be, if I give you the capability to predict your grade, um, you're going to feel more in control of the choices you make, right? That's a small t theory, um, and it's one that we can test by building an intervention of some kind, and then seeing what happens, so observe what goes on in lots of ways, and it's a multi-method kind of research approach. So some of those are going to be qualitative, some are going to be quantitative, um, but trying to, as best we can, observe, you know, observe and uh, interpret those observations in order to then suggest either a redesign to the theory or a redesign to the intervention, and it's iterative. So you keep designing toward better and better performance as you go. So this is an approach that's used in my field called the learning sciences. Um, the uh, expansion on this is a new idea called design-based implementation research, um, actually, um, there's a book coming out on this topic um, in the fall. Um, I'm one of its authors. Um, another is a colleague of mine in Colorado. But what we were trying to answer was this problem we often have in education research, where we build tools um, and we do research on interventions. And things might seem effective in the intervention, in the research on them. But then once the research ends and things get out into the real world, they either sort of regress back to some mean of use where it's not at all what you intended the intervention to be like or the effectiveness seems to go away, the context has changed so much. So this is an approach to doing research um, that is meant to be from the start collaborative, collaborative between the researchers and the practitioners, even in defining the problem space. Um, and as you're working, you're trying to build not just sort of a theory of why your tool works, why your intervention works, but also trying to build sort of a theory of implementation for it. So what are the conditions under which this is useful, and how will it be useful, and how can we build theory around its usefulness? So in many ways, the partnership that Mika and I have been working on for like four years now around this, where we just began with conversations, wouldn't it be fun if? Um, and then the tool evolved after that, and we teach inter 
approach has continued to evolve. Um, it's a combination of practitioners and researchers. In this case, so we're both playing both roles, but um, our goal here is to build an approach to teaching and a tool for use in teaching that will be potentially useful anywhere, um, and we certainly hope useful here at Michigan. So um, I wanted to put that out there as our research approach, sort of as a, since the Notes Learning Analytics Fellows meetings are coming to a close too, this is another way to think about the world in terms of design. And uh, the other thing is a comment with respect to the data we're working on. This is a sort of Bogos quote. Um, I say sort of because he actually tweeted, Has any, does anybody remember seeing this quote? Because he wanted to find a source for it, but he couldn't find it, and neither could I. But in general, we really mean just data when we're talking about big data. And we're not starting with big data here in that we don't begin by necessarily diving into the data warehouse. Um, but we are trying to, and we're also trying to take a very course-centric approach, which we've seen other examples of in the seminar. Um, but we're really trying to start from the bottom up and trying to um, have theories about what would predict performance and what would predict engagement um, and what would be useful for students and teachers. Uh, and then build something useful and scalable from that. And the objectives that we have for designing this system are to use the data to create this virtuous loop, this constant feedback cycle that both makes students more engaged and more productive and makes instructors more productive and more able to, to steer their students' learning and steer their students' engagement. So we're trying to accomplish all these things. Um, and maybe the idea of student facing and instructor facing is also not entirely new in the context of seminar, but we're trying to build it from the course level. We'll talk about some of the needs we have, because there are things that are very hard to do in the current analytics environment that uh, should be easier, and we'll talk about that. Let me hand this over to Nico. Oh, Mike, you want to talk about that? Well, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so the badges are one of the things that um, are these tools to reinforce the world of games, um, and so they are they are helpful to, to getting students to understand that there are lots of dimensions, different dimensions to evaluate. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about if they're using, and then I won't say abusing, but failures to, to use badges. Uh, basically, there are lots of things that you can do with badges, with the concept of a badge, like you know, so for example, a Go Excel badges or whatever. But there are so you can use them for assessment in various ways. Uh, you can use them um, instructional tools. Uh, so for example, you can handle student uh, knowledge. You can uh, basically have the kind of test, uh, get a sense of the prior competence. You can reward competence. Uh, you can uh, use them as motivational tools to have students sort of kind of buy into the use of the badges. That's hard to do in a course-centric approach. I think it uh, would work better if we had university wide badges, for example. But that's something that uh, the, the concept of badges can be helpful here. So, uh, yeah, so those are some of the ways in which uh, badges can be used. We can talk more about them and how to implement them and how not to implement them when we have some experience with whiteboarding and that. Um, so, what we'll do now, what I'll do now is I'll talk about uh, using these tools and approaches in my Public Ed 101. I've used a game tool uh, approach in my Public Ed 101 since fall 09. In five different iterations, I've, uh, last fall was the first time we used this tool, Great Graphs, which is incredibly helpful because some of these things do actually require different kinds of tools. Uh, uh, since Sean is here, I won't say that the great book and these tools should be criminalized. Uh, <laughs> But that was one of the difficulties. If I'm, I'm again just a master, I'm trying to use the uh, these tools great book uh, for a game tool approach, and it simply doesn't work. Um, so we wanted to create a tool. And one important thing about um, game tool approaches is to get students thinking about uh, how to how could they be in charge of uh, how they how they do with the thing. So we want to get them motivated about their learning. But they come here, understandably, incentivized to care about their work. And so we want to make that possible. So uh, so I'll show some data. I'll talk about the course a little bit first. But uh, we're interested in grading the course. Actually, as a matter of fact, grading the course as we've seen a moment, uh, almost everybody gets an A, and some of you will start throwing up. And I'll talk about that. But uh, we are interested in student performance in a course and what kinds of correlations there are. Um, one of the things we're interested in is the frequency of checking the predictor and rate track. Um, and the timing of the checking of the predictor is something that we don't actually have currently have data on. And that's simply because Kate and Stephen are in Belgium and are already cleaning up all through the night putting data tables together for us. And we feel like it, that would be that would be more useful for us. Right, exactly. If, if Brad could get to go to conference in Belgium, they could get to go to conference in Belgium, but the 
don't have all the data. We don't have the data warehouse data connected to student performance comparing uh, the students in that iteration of College Side 101 to earlier iterations and so on. But so, uh, so we don't have all of that data to show you, but we are actually analyzing it. So, so let me talk about this class. It's College Side 101. College Side has uh, four intro level classes, two are required for the major. 101 is introduction to political theory, but because it's 101, lots of incoming freshmen just think that well, college side 101, we're going to talk about Obamacare and sequester, and I'll give them Plato and Hobbes and Machiavelli, and they're like, WTF. Uh, so, <laughs> so one of the things I've been trying to do in this class is trying to get them thinking about, okay, why is this class different from what I thought it was going to be, and how do I make sense of that? So I'm interested in this kind of a metacognitive component, uh, metacognitive in intervention, simply as a solution to the voice of retention they have about this, this class. So what we do, what's gamified here is that there are three kinds of components. Uh, let's call the first common component. So we expect everybody to do them. Nothing is really required in this class, but we call them common components and we ex uh, expect everybody to go through them. And these are reading, uh, attendance in lecture, and participation in lecture, and, and some of you try to uh, make them interactive, and then participation in and these are what you might encounter in the game world as experiences. You just go through them. You either play so and so many words, it's kind of mindless and boring, but you do that. And there's small variance in possible points. So lecture attendance is kind of going for 100 and you have like 500 or something. And like Barry, I work with very large numbers. It's a way of getting students to not obsess about any given 100 points. And then the difference is often between tens, tens of thousands. So those are the common components. Everybody should go through them, and of course there is variance uh, between the flackers and the non-flackers, but that gives them a baseline. And I tell the students that there's no A for effort, but there's basically a C. You know, go through them and think, think how to get a C in this class. Then come the optional components, and this is the multiple path to achieve them. Uh, again, this is a class that where I'm interested in, less interested in offering specific competencies than getting students to think about how they learn this different kind of material, which gives me the great freedom to not worry about some particular thing. So for example, this is not a writing class. A writing is hugely important, but writing can be done in lots of different ways. So so th there is writing, there's conventional academic essays and blogging, but it doesn't have to be like that. And in some ways I would argue anecdotally at this point that this data later that a student who produces a song about Machiavelli or a video with, uh, with other students about Machiavelli will remember it much better than the person who really thinks about Machiavelli and Hobbes' theory and data matrix, whatever. So what they do, these optional components, they can, uh, they can write essays, they can blog, they can do a group project, or uh, this is actually Ben Peterson's invention, new media project, so students who want to do something new by eight others, uh, so they could do it alone. And, and their whole idea was to have them think about something in this, from this class and convey it through a, a podcast or a website or a forward video or things like that. So students select two of them. And here is uh, an in invention from um, a year ago. Students get to decide how much they, they, whatever they end up wanting to do is worth. They get to allocate the weight. And last semester, because we had this point system, and this because this was a political theory class, we called them capital with a K, as in Marx and capital. And they had six capital to allocate uh, between the, the optional components they chose, and they were simply multipliers of x. So if I'm you know, a standard uh, academic nerd uh, who knows that the conventional system that Barry talked about, uh, who does really well in that conventional system, I'm going to allocate five of my capital on essays, and may, then maybe one on blogging and not worry about too much about it. Or, as some students uh, did, do something very different. And these, all of these are scored or assessed or graded for quality, so there's high variance in any given instance, in addition to, of course, high variance for how students do the test. And then finally, uh, we had badges in this class. We had multiple badges. Again, political theory is less competence-based, so it was hard for us to think about competence-based badges. So what we wanted to do is make them sort of positive externalities, something like uh, trophies in a video game. So at some point, you might you know, see a 
tree will tell you in the top corner, ding, you've earned a trophy for two armed combat, which is not something that you tried to do. You tried to kill the ore, but you know you ended up doing that. So it's sort of a it's something that comes along the way when you do something particularly again. Um, and that was our goal for them. And in, in particular, the kinds of things that we wanted to reward are sort of good food, um, attending office hours, um, helping others, and, and things like that. That I'll talk about this in a, in a moment. This ended up not working particularly well. Uh, that particular approach for Badger didn't work particularly well. All right. So that's the overall structure. And then we used um, great graph to try to get students to buy in and to have them have feedback on this uh, as they went along. So something about the course. So it's uh, 300 students, 15 sections of 20 students, five CSIs. Each CSI has uh, three sections. And if you look at the overall grade, they're incredibly high. And some of you might say that this is horrible grade inflation. This is all I needed to know about uh, the world going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, but I actually am not particularly ap apologetic about this for a bunch of reasons. First of all, students in this class do a lot more than in my previous iteration of this class. I don't know if they do a lot more in, than in their other classes. And if we think that learning is hard to assess, but at least for some things, doing is learning, or at least is a pretty good proxy for learning, then this is not a bad outcome. I don't think, I mean, this is not an ideal outcome for me because I think that Ben will agree with me that not all the students who got into the A range in this grade group, and that's partly because of the badges. The badges ended up counting towards their grade, and so they became badge hunters in a way that was went against the very logic of what we want to do with badge hunters. So students on the whole did really well. But what's really interesting is that we still have pretty much a normal distribution on how well they did. So what you see here are, this is a histogram, so it's numbers of students. Uh, on the x-axis are uh, thousands of points. And it just turns out that A was roughly around here, so we had a huge number of students in the A range. But you'll notice that they're still the same distribution. So one of the things I want to encourage people to think who want to tinker with their uh, grading schemes is to think about how to set the level. That's very hard, especially if you set it too low at the beginning of the course. You can't, well, you might try to raise the cutoff higher, but I think you'll have a revolution worse than the Arab Spring if you try to do that. So you might pr start really high, but then you run the risk of demotivating them by making it impossible. So this is this is one of these sort of small logistical difficulties that's actually not trivial. So Barry and I, we are very committed to uh, these new ways of thinking about these courses, but at the same time, there are lots of logistical things that are take some tinkering with and just don't always work. But I wanted to have this slide to point out that, look, yeah, it looks like everybody did really well if you look at the grade, but not everybody did equally well. So it's this reverse of the bottom of the middle uh, leadership. All right, so here's something about the badges. I'm not going to walk through this entire, uh, these entire results, but these are um, Barry and Steven surveys of students, and these are questions about badges, about what the students thought about badges. Uh, the left bars are strongly disagree, right-hand bars are strongly agree, or, or agreement, so the middle green is neutral. Uh, I earned the badges I wanted. Um, hi, Barry. Uh, I wasn't in control of which badges I earned. Um, more agreement. And the badges motivated me to work harder. Here we have a lot of um, agreement. So again, students worked harder. We thought they didn't work harder for the right reasons. And so this is again something to think about. But but that was a that was help. That was a helpful something. Uh, I shared my badge achievements with friends. Nah, not so much. Uh, so the, the nerd effect or like the show off effect wasn't working yet. I saw the badges as extra credit. Yes, everybody did that. So that's why they went after them. My structure was impartial when awarding badges. A little bit of variance there, but for the most part, they were satisfied. Again, it's important to remember that there were five GSIs. We grade norm almost everything except the badges one. We tried to do that a little bit. So it's interesting to see that you still get, for the most part, student satisfaction. Uh, the skill or behavior each badge represented was clear to me. Yes, to some, not to others. Uh, so again, high variance. Uh, I, I am 
understood what to do in order to earn his badge. Again, not entirely true. So if you want to use badges, this is something that you'll definitely want to think a lot about, not just how to implement it, but what are they trying to do, and then how do you make sure that they are doing the thing you want, because again, what these badges ended up doing was a form of extra credit for you. And you might say, that that's exactly what I wanted these badges for, and if that's your way, that's fine. But I would think about that pretty hard. So that's just about the badges. Now, now I'm going to go to the user breakdown. And in particular, the predictor. Again, we didn't have a screenshot of the predictor, but what the predictor allows the students to do is that, let's say uh, we're in first week of October. I still have about 60% of the assignments to do. Let me imagine, and they can literally say, I'm going to get 4,000 points for this essay. I, ima I, I imagine I'll get so, so and so many points for this. Um, and so on for every other assignment. And in this, in my class, and let's see if I allocate all my capital on this particular set of assignments. How can I do that? So it's basically a way of thinking about uh, what kinds of behaviors should I engage in for the rest of the semester, and what would be the best way of doing it. So we invite the students to engage in these behaviors in the course. And what you see here is on the x-axis is student class rank. This is easy to pull off of off the grade craft data, so it's I think we put you know. 50 points total. And the scatter plot represents uh, predictor beats. How many times did the students play with the predictor? There, there are some serious OTD types here who played with it almost 100 times, which does not seem particularly helpful, especially if the student was sort of in the middle. Uh, but this is a point three three correlation, highly significant. Uh, and point three uh, correlation coefficient in the social sciences, we know it. It matters. Now, we're not making any kinds of causal claims about this, that using the predictor was somehow for a cause for them doing well. It's probably, I mean, if you ask this, you speculate as to this, that better students, more invested students are more sort of interested in figuring out ways to do well, and this is one way of doing it. So that's probably what's going on, but we don't know. So it's interesting. Obviously, we didn't reveal this finding which became clear to me around uh, November to the students because then the data would have got contaminated in about five minutes. We told them that, you know, the more you use the predictor, the better you do. Uh, that would, would have been sad. So that's an example. And here is the same uh, from Stephen's data survey. So, so it's 0.338 um, correlation coefficient between four in the course and the students in the predictor. I'm not going to spend uh, I'm talking about the, the other uh, data. But that's just basically the figure of the number versus all the previous difference. Um, and this is, uh, again, a scatter plot of the same data in a different way. So these are point totals. These are mapped onto uh, the letter grade categories. So you see these are high, there's a highly significant, uh, pretty strong correlation between how well they did and uh, how much they used. Now, here's an interesting contrast. This scatter plot, which is pretty much zero correlation, is something that we are actually very happy about. On the x axis is an, a result from uh, this uh, patterns of uh, adaptive learning styles. So, um, it's a survey that's supposed to track. track students' learning personality traits. Uh, it's a well-developed uh, tool used for lots of different purposes. But what's interesting to us is that this thing that's supposed to track people's learning styles and motivation actually has no minimal correlation to how they did in this class because we changed the incentive structure by changing the grading system. So another way of making this inference a little more strongly would be to say that what we thought were personality traits about how you learn are in fact artifacts of incentive structures such as grading systems. And if that's true, which we think it is, it's really significant. And obviously means that you need to think about how you incentivize your students, how you grade them. So that's where we are right now. And uh, what we need to do, what we want to do, and what we need to do next. Uh, we are interested in what other people want to do. Uh, we want to 
much more people that need to be involved in this and uh, align a bit stuff that Barry talked about in terms of the design base and implementation of these things. We want to think about, we, we want more uh, implementation. Um, and we are interested in figuring out what the possible connections to tools that can be needed to create these tools and things like that are. Um, and we want to do more research on how instructors and learners make use of progress and uh, process and progress data. The one thing I didn't mention uh, that what we ended up doing, so the instructor phasing aspect of rate track gives us a, a ranking of all the students in the class. And it was really helpful in our weekly GSI meeting to look at the bottom 10, bottom 20, and just go through the GSI and say, okay, uh, what's wrong with Eric? Eric's at the bottom. Uh, is anything going on? And it might be that, yeah, you know, he's an athlete and there are problems, or that, no, he's just, he's going to do the group projects and hasn't gotten points yet. And so it was very helpful for thinking for us to identify at risk students and, and see where they are problems. So it was, you know, the real time uh, analytics that helped us do interventions, think more carefully about what we were doing, and so on. Um, so, yeah, so we need better grading tools. One of the things about grade trap, um, one of the problems with that, and all of the things that what we're trying to do is the fact that what games do and we don't do well is the instant feedback, especially if you use instruments that require human beings, which edX is now soon claiming that we don't need that, but for the time being, we need human beings to read blog posts and read papers and things like that. That's really hard to do really fast. We're trying to do that, but we think that a gameful system, gameful grading system shouldn't deserve and require instant feedback or as almost as instant feedback as possible to make the multiple attempts meaningful. And that's really hard to do. So that's something that we want to think about ways of doing that. And although, although we might say frequent feedback. Right. So comparing I, many of my students who experienced in my class for the first time will say, this is so different. In my engineering course, I don't know what my grade's going to be until the final. Right? So it's basically everything is, is saved up to the end. Um, and that's clearly the opposite of, of what we're going for. Right. So And what, what, what I've ended up doing in, in this class and other classes is that occasional bi-weekly feedback on how the class is doing in general, how students are doing. And that's that's certainly better than many other classes. So I guess at this point, we should be more than happy to um, answer any questions that people have. I thought we stunned them. Right, so the question is how much time, uh, we're repeating the question for the video. So the question is how much time do we have to spend on teaching the tool, not, and not just the tool, but the team, and quite a bit. Um, and my solution to that has been simply to say, let's make this part of the learning process. So it's in some ways a metacognitive intervention, and I, I elsewhere call it opening the hood. So I want to open the hood to the logic of this tool. And that way, it becomes something that's just a little more meaningful than just going through the motions. So yes, you have to devote some time. And if you don't, you will get a lot of resentment. Even if you do, you will get some resentment. It goes back to uh, Barry's point earlier. Students are very good at, Michigan students are very good at the, the current system. They don't like change when you change the rules. So you have to try to not just explain it, but motivate it. And then given that great track was in, I'd say, somewhere between alpha and uh, beta, uh, it didn't always work. And um, I don't know if Kate slipped at all the fall semester, but, but so she had to make frequent fixes. And that can also be slightly costly. And we had to spend some time 
not just explaining it, but literally working with a tool that you didn't even know was there. And I, and I would say Gradecraft itself is a response to that problem. So the very first year I started using this in a big way, these approaches with my class, we didn't have a Gradecraft. Um, and so the students, it, there was no sort of external representation of what I was trying to get at. And Gradecraft provides that. And with the iterative design based research ideas, we'll get better at it. But it really was helpful for them to be able to visualize the point and see what's going on. And that's something the current gradebook just doesn't support. So for that, that was an, an advance. Right in the back, the back. Okay, so the question is, at what point do students choose the optional components and do them the weighting? Uh, about halfway through, around the fall break, um, so midterm time if you use exams and those. But uh, what we wanted to do is that uh, we wanted to have them a chance to try any of those things. Now, the group project is, of course, a big uh, building up to a project at the end of the term. But they had an opportunity to think about it. We actually had a couple of badges connected to sort of low stakes badges connected to thinking about blogging, thinking about group projects. This was Ben's idea, actually. Um, so they'll, they'll basically have an opportunity to attempt any other things that they might be interested in and get some feedback, some formative feedback, summative and formative feedback, the low stakes uh, summative and then formative feedback. And then and they can play with the producer uh, all throughout, but about halfway through the semester, they can play them till they're really locked in. And that's when they have to make the change. And there are other ways to do so. If Nika's class uses this capital and weighting idea, my class doesn't. In my class, I just provide all these different options that combine with the weight. So the, the weighting is sort of built into the, the student's choice and what assignments they do. The, the capital turned out to be a tremendous technical challenge. The grade craft is a challenge there. So you can choose which path you want to use in your instruction. And there was a question up here. So the, the question is about badges and how we might change students thinking about them. So actually, I think we should probably have a whole session on this on spot on badges. Um, it's, a, it's a big, a, there's a lot of talk right now in the education space about badges. Um, I just came back from a full day meeting at the National Class Foundation on this, and there's been a lot of MacArthur driven talk about it um, in various spaces. Um, so the essential idea here is to get students, is to, is to use badges as, an, as a, a better indicator of learning, a finer grained indicator of learning and competence than grades currently are. So if you think about it, we have a badge system right now at the university. Um, you take Nika's class, you get an A or a B, probably meh. Um, I, by the way, I prefer to think of that as the sense of what an excellent teacher he is, right? That he's gotten all of his students to that point of achievement. Um, but you know, we have this single point badge for a course, and then we have a transcript. And so essentially what transcripts really are, are um, a, it's a branding exercise, right? That the, a 3.5 in Michigan, mean somehow something different than 3.5 at Michigan State, and it's up for the person interpreting the brand to figure out which one they value more. Um, and um, in the case of badges, we want these we want these to indicate what you can really do and are good at. And in a well-designed badging system, the, the learner also should get to sort of choose how to present themselves in different settings. So when Nika said part of the challenge for him is that his students, the badges were only for his class. That, I think, is the limiting factor. That when we have a bad, like a single instance bad system that's only sort of redeemable, if you will, in that space, it's very hard to get away from the extra credit approach. My approach was not to make badges worth anything at all. Uh, they were simply there if you wanted them. And um, students, there were some students who could care less and some students who were really jazzed about it. We actually printed stickers. So we had students sticking them on their books and on their backpacks. You know, for some people, that's sort of fun, and they like that, that enhances the ability of the class, but it didn't affect their grade. But what we really need are badge ecosystems, right? So if, if, if you teach Poli-Sci 102, and you get a student out of Nika's Poli-Sci 101, it would be really helpful for you as an instructor, I claim, to know in a fine grain what these students are good at, um, not just that they got an A or a B. So that's, I think, the real, you know, the real potential value of badges. So, you know, again, that's another thing we're looking for volunteers for is to try to find a, some ecosystem where that makes sense, right, where, where, where we can work together to, to define what the badges are in my intro level classes that you want to use in your advanced level classes. I just want to add to that, that if you want to use, continue to use them in a single class and if 
if your desire is to use them as sort of trophies you earn on the way for doing something good, the solution would be thought about a lot and got from many students who might try it is simply uh, non-transparent non -transparent badges. So now students knew in advance what they could get, make them invisible. And the first time, the reason they did, uh, you came to office hours, you were the first person to come to office hours, you got that badge, and that badge is now out of circulation. Uh, so that's something that you can do if you want to incentivize sort of students to think about what does it mean to go beyond the policy. So uh, again, there are lots of different uses. So badges are, are exciting, but it's important to remember that they cover a whole lot of things. So experimental use. So the question is essentially about sequencing in courses and whether badges and other kinds of competency relates to that, right, I think. Not badges, yeah. badge, okay. Um, so we'll probably each have slightly different answers to that. I mean, actually, my course does have a little bit of sequencing in it and that there's certain, when, they, when people in my class form their final project groups, if they choose to do a group project, um, they have to have certain, certain, they have to have shown mastery of certain ideas. But that's more so I make sure we get a balance of things going on in the group um, and to prevent sort of teams of slackers um, from forming and producing nothing. But um, I, I think it matters, right? I think you're, you're touching on, I think you have a small t theory about that. Um, and I, I, I believe it would bear out, right, that, um, that a good game has a progression. It gets harder as you go and you, um, you learn things in the early going that become really important later. Um, and so I, I, I think that that would enhance a gameful experience if it were clear to learners that there was a, that there's a reason they're learning these sub, sort of sub skills now. And that later on they get to apply it. There's actually this really interesting assessment idea in games. Um, they don't call it an assessment idea, but the boss battle. If you're not familiar with the boss battle, at the end of a, a level in a game, you often face sort of a big challenge. It's a bad guy that's really hard to beat, but a hard to beat a, 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 a boss. What you usually do is take the stuff you learned in the level and in previous levels and reapply it or recombine it in a different way. So that's like the ultimate transfer goal that we're going for in most of our instruction. And um, in gameful design, we try, you know, I actually call my final assignments boss battles with the idea that now you have to take what you know and do something different with it, as opposed to what the typical end of the unit test is, which is the problems we just spent a, a week practicing, um, and now you're going to see the same problem again. Um, but maybe I changed the numbers or something. Yeah, I have a slightly different angle on that. And in my class, even though I said there are not competencies, in fact, what it is about, uh, what political theory is about is how to think about particular kinds of arguments, how to interpret arguments, and how to apply them in different ways. And that, to me, when you think about it, is actually can be done using lots of different media. So argumentation can work, con conveying, conveying understanding and interpretation and applying it can be done in lots of different ways. So, so it's not random that I have uh, blogging conventional papers and then these new media projects. So they are in some ways connected to the things that I do care about. And and I'd argue that there's in some ways, some we can also differentiate whether students do it really well. So for example, one group decided to come up with a board game as a group project. A board game called The State of Nature, that's Master, Brutish, and Short. Uh, and it, what is really brilliant is it emulates Thomas Hobbes' conception of the state of nature into the uh, game logic, the rules of that game. And then I can very confidently say, I'm interested in students understanding this one important aspect from the social contract theory, which is the concept of the state of nature, and then the logic of the collective action problem, and here they have demonstrated it. A ga unsuccessful game would be a, a trivial pursuit game, which many students do produce, and that what did Hobbes stop? That what did Hobbes think is not conveying to me what, what I really care about. So. So I have thought about what kinds of assignments, non-conventional assignments, capture what I do care about. But it's still not exactly the same as the sequencing thing that Deb said. So, um, so Deb is um, is quite it's it's um it's a it's in part a I think a good observation, right? That there are many things we can capture that would help make the purpose of classes much more clear to students if articulated well by competency. Um, but that the fundamental challenge may remain in actually coordinating these things across faculty. 
um, which is true, right? I mean, even when we sit together and try to figure out whether our course sequences are actual sequences, um, that's that's you know that's that's actually difficult work. Um, I would also add one more thing to the mix, which is there's a lot of things that are that are valuable that we hope our students learn that are not actually articulated very well in the learning goals for our classes. Um, some of them are better articulated than others, like becoming good writers and, and presenters. Many people put those kinds of goals in their in their course objectives, um, and then they have a presentation grade that is sort of form in addition to substance. But what about things like um, being a good being a leader, um, um, or you know being a good a good uh, email communicator, or I mean there's all kinds of different things we could gauge. Um, being a good mentor, um, um, always you know. There's sort of we have we had badges and I think you had badges for like attendance streaks, right? Being reliable. Um, these are things that don't get captured, but that are actually kind of interesting to know. And employers might care, um, and the students might care to present themselves that way. And I think DSA refers to these as co-curricular um, op learning opportunities, also. So badges are a way to capture all that. Have I not answered your question about how to get faculty aligned yet? No, I have not. Um, I think this is part of the hard work, right? So I'm actually I'm I'm interested in finding maybe a department that wants to um, wants to work on this kind of grading thinking. And um, there's some candidates around here, like the MSI program, the School of Information. Um, it's sort of a, a small, contained master's program. It's not tiny. It's got a couple hundred students in it. Um, but they've been wondering aloud, you know, when did students start getting so grade focused? And there are all these things we wish they would engage in that um, that they're not engaging in the same way they did, say, five or six years ago. Um, you know, this, the idea of, of adding sort of a game layer over the whole program is really interesting in that in that case. Um, and that creates the need for faculty to get together and talk about it. Will we be any better at it than we were before? I don't know. Um, but it's, an, it's a conversation we, we really should be having. So I think there was in the back, and then we'll come back up to the front. So Laura's question is about whether you could build the uh, badge system into something like a STEM class where we have sequences. And I think that that's kind of what ideally we would, would could do and would have in mind. So that would be a field or a department specific. I mean, part of it is that what's really interesting in STEM fields, it would be ideally something like a STEM badge ecosystem because you might be do, you might learn something in biochemistry class or chemistry class or even physics class that is relevant for your classes. So so it would be a way of, this is in some ways a follow up on Deb's question, so it would be a way of cutting across some of those things that uh, folks in the say LFA curriculum committee tear their tear out about on thinking about, okay, is this an appropriate prerequisite? And if we actually thought about sort of big competencies that are narrower than an entire course, but key features uh, and would include sort of not quite co-curricular, but skill-like labs, mm -hmm. I think that that would be a great way. I mean, I would imagine something like STEM, some set of STEM departments would be a great experimental ground for this at some point. So I mean, yes, that would be great. I mean, wouldn't you love to look across your class roster and see that 90% of them have their lab safety badge and that 70% of them are competent with basic statistical analysis, right? That would really change what you want to spend your time on in the first couple of weeks of class. So this is on one of Mika's last slides, right? The idea that uh, we need better grading tools also. So right now the limitation is that you grade more frequently and you enter more data. Um, we would love to build um, tools to make that easier and automated and for some kinds of things. I don't think you could automate all of them. Like badge awarding, for instance. Suppose you had a really good uh, sort of speed grading rubric. And so you were already assessing papers or assignments with a rubric. It could be that certain combinations of things you would mark off in the rubric automatically assign a badge um, for something that you could predefine. It could be that attendance of a certain, you know, as you're marking people present, um, or as the system is marking people present, um, that you automatically might earn a badge at a certain point. I, I, but those are sort of trivial examples, and it gets harder. So my, my basic theory of change after studying change for a while is that I've got to do two things. I've got, to show, I've got to first show you that I can do something you value. I think we've done that. But then I've got to show you that the cost for you of doing it is affordable. Um, cost in all the ways we think about cost, not just money. Um, and I don't think we've done that. Um, 
So it, there is right now that the cost is high. Gradecraft itself is, a, is an attempt, a design attempt, to lower that cost. Um, but we have a long way to go to make it easy. So uh, people want to play with these ideas, I strongly recommend it. Actually, I will say one thing I've noted about my own syllabi, which I, I bet you would back me up on, is that sort of halfway approaches don't work. You can't sort of make your class gameful, right? Because that is window dressing, it's gamification. Students see right through it, and they just figure out a new way to play you. Um, so uh, you have to sort of go all in when you make this switch. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't work out the same way. Um, that's something I've observed. So we're working on that. You know, we think we need more. Right now, we have a sort of model of teaching that's sort of assumed and transmitted by osmosis. Um, and we have great organizations like Serial T helping people become better teachers. Um, this is a, introducing another, yet another pedagogical model and trying to develop structures to make it easier for people to learn how to do. And that we're, we're climbing that hill. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that I've heard here. And we do know that JSL is the thing that I promote that that it saves a lot of the first different kinds of at first class. That's the sort of standard one that I've heard is it gives you a chance to test on a student level and have to give some tests to the other students. So No, but I'm actually mindful, and, and you mentioned these classes, but I'm mindful of your class also. And the risk is that I'm willing to, you know, I have one year up to whatever I want, and I fire if I didn't think this was what this thing should be done, and it doesn't want to incur that teaching cost and make me think too much into it. So I actually can be useful to you and your more explanation of uh, the different plans that are working at this point. So it is a big question. I don't think we have a like an answer. I think part of the answer is to then choose sides between your uh, grades and your some of, some of us are more willing to accept some number of down times to get better and get to the point where you have to break by the teacher and make sure that um, you didn't have that that point of failure and I think we're gonna solve that. I mean I think one of the underlying issues of learning analytics in the field is to think about our ways to make sense of what students are doing automatically um, without without instructor intervention. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have automated essay grading that is as good as instructor essay grading. Um, but there there probably are things we could learn from this learning analytics work that will that will help make this a little bit easier. That's we have the time for one more question. It's a complicated question. I think there are three questions in here. One is that how do we simply um, make sure that students are not, that students don't feel like they have to do everything. I mean, that's not just a batch question. It's just the assignment question and the communication classes in general. One simple way of, two simple ways of doing that is to connect with students. And, and four is to say, first of all, point out, uh, you can earn 80,000 points in this class, 50,000 get to teach you, for them to realize you don't have to do everything. And then explicitly say so. Uh, and then explicitly say that, think about what you're interested in, what you might already be good at, the leverage skills you already have, if you want to play it safe, or if you want to take a risk. So those are my suggestions and questions of what you might want to do. And it's not just that, it's just the point. But the, to connect to your second question, how do we, how do we you know, give students the information on how to think about this in the past, and later on, and, and what time frames are necessary? And I think that that's where we connect to uh, not just not just collecting analytics, but from analytics, something like this being recommender. And so I think that that is the key, connect to recommenders. Like if you're thinking about this kind of learning path, not to make it clear, but just to make it clear, then you might focus on, on whatever, focus on becoming very good at lab uh, as opposed to just computation and assignments and things like, like that. So I think that it's, you know, this is just one small part of the position where the student says, recommenders and or whatever um, is the key. And, and a lot of it's the ecosystem again, right? Sort of building those. So let's go find some 
graduate programs and, and seek to hire our graduates and try to define with them sets of skills that we can then serve as badges and just talk to our registrar and we'll see if we can get badges represented somehow for them to go out. I mean, these are all hard work, but things that would happen. And after I spoke at the NSF meeting on badges, I got invited to a meeting of college admissions officers. Um, so wouldn't that be an interesting twist, right, to think about not the SAT score and the GPA, but something broader that is still possible but doesn't cost much in some, some timely way. Um, and badges, they think, may offer that opportunity as well. Okay, let's give another round of applause.